Hi guys and gals. Hope you're doing well. Yes, I do. It's boiling hot here. Oof, dear. Shocking. And I've just cleaned my keyboard. And uh, some people asked, have asked me what I use for my cleaning my keyboard. And it's quite simply this. A bottle of isopropyl alcohol. Yes. And uh, a normal sort of microfiber cloth. Which is looking quite dirty. So I'd better not have those in camera shot. So, yeah. Now, last week, and in previous weeks, I've been talking about noise reduction, and principally, noise reduction in raw therapy. And it's, as I mentioned at the end of last week's video, it has spawned a bit of a conversation um, about um, Topaz Denoise, or Topaz Denoise AI2, to be precise. And I'm not going to give you a lowdown on um, using Topaz Denoise because mm, it's out there. There's tons and tons, there's hundreds of hours of video on YouTube on how to use Topaz Denoise. Um, but they're all using it the same way. And they fundamentally use it as a plugin for either Lightroom or Photoshop. Now, there's a wee bit of a problem with using it as a standardised plugin because, you see, if I write, you'll remember this little Arbis mouse from the previous video. Now, if I go to um, edit in, I can edit in Topaz Denoise AI. I can also edit in Topaz Denoise AI there because over in the Lightroom preferences, Topaz Denoise is in as the secondary external editor. But here's the problem. Its file format is TIFF, Profoto RGB, 16-bit component, 300 pixels per inch. That's fine. But that means that this image, as it is inside a Lightroom, is baked into a raster file, a raster image file which is what a TIFF fundamentally is. You have to think of raw processing as baking a cake. And while the image is in the raw format of one description or another, you still got the cake mix in the bowl. So, you know, I mean, using Topaz Denoise on a rasterized image is a bit like, hmm, you've just baked a cake uh, or a fruit cake, and take me out of the oven and you've realised you've forgot to put the fruit in. Yeah, you can't really go and put the fruit in. But while it's still in the mixing bowl, you can add more fruit, you can add different fruit, you can add a little bit of alcohol, yeah, or whatever. Yeah, so the longer you can keep your image in a raw format, mm, the better off you're going to be in the long run. So... As I've said, on YouTube, you can find lots of videos that show you how to use Topaz. Um, but they are invariably showing you how to use Topaz as a plug-in on a rasterized image. Uh, here's the funny thing. If I right-click on this image and I go show in Finder, I can actually take this RAW file directly into Topaz. But there is a little bug in the Topaz system because if I right-click and I, I go Open With and I go Open With Denoise AI 2.2.7 which is the latest one as far as I know um, there's a little bit of a giveaway. Just let it finish processing the image. Looks a little bit dark, doesn't it? But here's the giveaway. It says Apply. Launching an image into, or well, launching a RAW file into Topaz Denoise. This way, Topaz Denoise mistakenly thinks you're using it as a plugin. So we're going to click cancel on that. And we're going to click no, I don't want you to save anything. And all we're going to do is open up Topaz Denoise as a standalone. And we're just going to take the raw file 
and drag and drop it into Topaz. There we go, we're at a 329% view. Why that is, I do not know. So we'll come into a one-to-one -one view and you can see we've got the RAW file. Now, yes, we can remove the noise, we can sharpen it, we can recover a bit of original detail, but it's a little bit on the gloomy side, isn't it? And then, of course, if we'd chosen to process it, we could go save image and we can save as the DNG. Now then, that DNG file, I said in the previous video that I wasn't going to make this video about Topaz until I'd actually managed to find out exactly what this DNG file is because it isn't a proper one. Now you have to remember that DNG is not a file format ostensibly, it's a file container format. And if we convert our raw files to DNG files with say the Adobe DNG converter, or you've got a camera that will actually record DNG, what it's doing it's recording a raw file and putting it inside a DNG container. Um, I get the feeling that this is more like a TIFF inside a DNG container. And so, you know, mm. the only thing is Lightroom will read this DNG file properly. But as you saw in the video, towards the end of the video last week, things like raw therapy, I don't know whether Affinity Photo can read it or Luminaire, but oh, is it Luminar? Luminar. Um, I don't know if those two can uh, read the file properly, but I know the likes of raw therapy can't. And I know it's not alone. You sort of get this wild magenta red cast all over everything. So what I just want to do is to click cancel on there. And uh, I'm just going to close that out and say, no, I don't want you to uh, save that either. And I'm going to show you a very, very good way of using it as a plugin, but keeping the full 32-bit raw workflow going inside of Photoshop. And no, you can't do this in GIMP. If I right click and I go edit in, instead of going edit in Photoshop 2020 or edit in Topaz Denoise, I can edit open as a smart object inside of Photoshop. Now, this isn't going to be a rasterized image converted to a smart object or put inside a smart object. It's actually going to be a raw file. Yes. So, if I go open as smart object in Photoshop, and there it is, and you can tell it's a smart object because it has this little icon in the bottom right-hand corner. Now, here's the thing. I can go to Filter, Topaz Labs, Topaz Denoise AI. And you saw a little notice there and it said you're invoking it as a plugin. Now look at the difference in the image. Notice how much brighter it is. If you remember in the video last week, we were doing targeted denoise inside of raw therapy on this um, out of focus gray background uh, because it was very noisy and quite distracting. So we've now got a smart object inside Photoshop and we are applying Topaz Denoise as a smart filter. Alrighty, let's go and have a look at the Denoise level. So I can turn that down to zero and then I should get all my noise back in the background. Well, that's funny because I don't. So we're going to come into 200% so we can see what we're doing. We get a little bit. Notice it says preview down here. Um, it's not the world's most accurate preview. So if I double click on remove noise, then I get all my existing or default, I should say, noise reduction back. All I'm going to do is turn it down to probably four or three. And then we're just going to have a look at the sharp detail in the face of the wee harvest mouse. And does he need all that level of sharpening? Let's just go back to 100%. So we can see properly. And it does keep gen regenerating the preview. Some people recommend turning auto-update preview off. And that's something you can do 
if you get fed up of the constant whirring of the preview. I actually don't think it looks too bad, but I might just turn it down a little bit. Probably turn it down to about 8. And then what we'll do is now we can go and click that blue button that says Apply. So we can now apply these settings to Topaz Denoise AI 2 as a smart filter on a smart object. If I go into the image at 100% and I think to myself, yeah, well, that looks A-OK, -okay, but I could just do with making a few tweaks to the mouse in terms of lightness and saturation. So, of course, with it being a smart object, I can double click the smart object and I'm going to leave it in a fit to screen view or moderately fit to screen view. Um, let's just sort of take it up to 66%. Now I can sort of see what I'm doing. And what I want to do is just add a little bit of vibrance. Add a little bit of saturation. Maybe a tiny bit of clarity. But I'm just going to soften all that off by just taking out, or if you like, adding a little bit of negative dehaze. I'm going to warm the entire image up a little tiny bit. It's a bit overkill, isn't it? But I'll do it overly so, so you can sort of get the idea of what's happening, uh, just in case we suffer from a bit of video compression. And I might just turn the highlights down a smidge and open up the shadows a smidge bit like that all right so he fundamentally looks different all we're going to do now is go and click OK and so what it's doing now is making the changes to the smart object but look here Topaz is now going to update itself yes it is so now I can go and change the settings yet again if I think I need to Let's just see if it's taking off or adding too much noise reduction. I think it possibly is. We'll just take a little bit of sharpening off. Just a little bit. And I think it looks A-OK. -okay. So now what we'll do is click apply. And there we go. So yes, I can fundamentally now go in and mask this if I want to. Let us, what could we do? Let's go and have a look at a light two mask. Um, a light mid-tone mask, I think. We'll go mask. And we'll go filter mask. And so now you can see that we've actually got that mask over the Topaz Denoise filter. Not that it's going to do us any blooming favours, but I'm just showing you a potential for a workflow. Of course, if I now go and invert that mask, now I've got my noise gone out of my background. You do have to be careful with topaz, though, and the topaz sharpening, because sometimes, especially when you get on super fine detail like this, you will start to generate sharpening halos and sharpening artifacts. And, of course, we can see we've got subtle, slight uh, denoise uh, artifacting going on in there as well but fundamentally it all depends what your end use target is for your image i mean if it's a, if it's a 60 inch print um, you might have to go in and retouch this image uh, to, so you know you might have to but if all you're doing is printing a4 or a3 um, this image will be fine yes of course it will so there we go so what I'm going to do now is shut that image down and I'll say don't save and we're going to come to uh, back to Lightroom and I'm just going to pull up this shot of hey good old Ollie this is my friend Ollie Martin Dahl who runs Norway Nature uh, King Eagle yes he's the guy we use for guides when we go off to do all our eagle photography trips and just have a look at this shot of Ollie. Now, all I want to say to you is this. Um, with regards to noise reduction, 
I mean, this he shot at, what, 25,600 ISO on an old Canon 1DX. Um, a pretty good camera, very good camera in its day, and still a good camera now, but ISOs at this sort of speed rating in very, very low light um, render images that look pants, frankly, and are riddled with noise for the simple reason that things do get noisy inside the camera, and we are underexposing, because don't forget, a camera, a digital camera, uh, the sensor has only got one ISO speed, if you like. And so, if you, it's called its base ISO, and fundamentally, it's fixed. So anybody who thinks that changing the ISO value um, on your ISO settings on your camera changes the sensitivity of your sensor, is talking absolute bullcrap. Seriously, bullcrap. Do not believe them, uh, because it doesn't. All it does is underexpose the image and then increase the post-shot gain amplification of the image. And that is why you get all the noise, because this is the this is the, the basically the main sensor noise of the uh, camera that is increased in gain, so increased in visibility, along with the photon count. Um, of the actual shot, which is what contains all the picture information. So, in other words, signal-to-noise ratio, exceptionally low. And I suppose what I'm getting at here is, <laughs> it doesn't record super fine detail. Not at big high ISOs like this. No camera does. Modern cameras have a tendency to record slightly more. But, well, you know, you've only got to push them a third of a stop outside their operational envelope, and they'll all produce images that look like this. And when you get noise on an image that looks like this, you cannot turn it into a bloody masterpiece. So, please do not fall for all the... I was going to use a rude word there, but we'll say don't fall for all the flannel and fluff that some manufacturers uh, would have you believe because you can't produce miracles you can't reveal detail in a shot that isn't there in the first place um, but obviously this is in Lightroom and it needs a little bit of um, a little bit of jiggery pokery, uh, get rid of some of the contrast for starters, and then bring the exposure back. And now we can see we've got a little bit more detail in here, but not very much. Now, if I just right click and I go show in Finder, and then I pull up uh, Topaz Denoise, and then I was to drag this raw file into here, and um, Topaz Denoise makes a terrible job out of it. It can't cope with the colour and the hot pixel noise. So we could we could try dialing up the colour noise reduction. But it's not going to make much of a difference at all. It's not too bad. But, you know, it is what it is. So, there you go. It, 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 can have a bit of a problem with um, colour noise removal and this colour noise reduction slider doesn't always um, it's not always as kind to your image as you might like so of course we could go we could go and open this as a smart object inside of photoshop but you know i mean we are we will make a better job of it to tell you what let's let's actually go and do it Instead of talking about it, we'll just go right click, sh uh, not show in Finder, we'll go edit, open a smart object inside Photoshop. And so again, we can go to filter, Topaz Labs, Topaz ne Denoise AI, open it up as a plugin, just let it run for a little bit, generating the preview. And we are going to now, instead of needing to 
add more denoising, what we've got to do is we've got to remove some. So let's take it all the way down to zero and then see what happens. Let's just lift it up to four. Let's take it up a little bit more, take it up to eight, take it up to 11. And now you can see we're starting to lose detail. So we could go to attempt to recover some original detail. And mm, it's not making a very good job of it, but it's not too bad. And of course, what we can do is now apply. So now we've got the smart filter active on the image. Let's just take it up to 100% and just let's have a look. And of course, again, we can go back in and re-edit the raw file. What could we need to take out of there? We could actually possibly get away with um, changing the sharpening from Lightroom or Camera Raw's default and just go to full unsharp mask sharpening by leaving the sharpening roughly where it is. Let's just turn it down a little bit, probably to around about 30. But turning the radius down to 0 0.5 and taking the detail recovery slider completely down to 0. And obviously, what else could we do? Let's just go and warm the image up just a little tiny tad. So we've rejigged the sharpening. Let's go OK. So let's rejig the uh, smart object. And of course, now we'll get a revamp potential for Topaz Denoise. And there we go. Overall, that's looking a lot better now than it did before. Yeah, a lot, lot better. So we could go and click apply again. And there we go. So fundamentally what we've done is a sort of a two-step noise reduction. And we've got a lot more definition in his gravestones that he's got in his gob. Uh, he's got more than I have. And uh, we've got pretty good definition in the beard. And we've lost a lot of noise off the face. Of course, we've lost a phenomenal amount. We've lost all the noise out of the background. But, well, there you go. So that's just another sort of little technique you can do inside of um, Photoshop. And, of course, this is all still raw. Yes, it is. So, of course, you could then go and rasterize this entire group there and save it out as a 16-bit TIFF if you wanted to. But, I mean, all in all, you've got to admit, if I hold down the uh, Alt key, um, we just zoom out. Yeah? I mean, it looks a lot better. And if you wanted it for a website or whatever, you crop it down, reduce it in size to a more usable size for the website, and you'd be up and running and laughing. Yes, you would. Because the image has got pretty much no noise in it. And when you consider what we started off with, yeah, uh, especially if I go reset and add all Lightroom's horrible nasties. Look at the teeth. Yeah, shocking. Look at the teeth now. And we'll come back into 100%. Yeah, difference is phenomenal, isn't it? So the last thing I'm going to do is to come back to Lightroom and I'm just going to show you why I do like um, using Topaz in this way. And I've got a picture of a Gossel. Yes, now it's 4000 ISO, um, but it's a very, very low shutter speed. So you can sort of tell this is virtually in the dark. And of course, we've got Lightroom's horrible processing on it. So, I mean, ostensibly, we could shoot this into Photoshop as a smart object and then re-edit it inside um, Photoshop, inside Adobe Camera Raw. But, I mean, it is one and the same thing. So, all I'm going to do here is just do a straightforward process version swap to get the contrast under control. Because what we've now done is we've changed the supposed linear curve to a subtle inverted S-shaped tone curve. But I'm just going to bob the exposure back. I'm going to put a little bit of the contrast back. 
And then I'm going to do that little dodge or wheeze with the clarity slider because this, let me just put this back and I'll just blow the image up a little bit so you can see this area here. Um, I don't know if there's a bit of movement on it or it's just slightly in front of the near depth of field limit so at 5.6 which is <laughs> pretty much wide open on this lens uh, well it isn't it is stop down a stop but there is a little bit of fuzziness to these feathers here there's no fuzziness here there's no fuzziness here it's all in razor sharp focus which is pretty good for one one hundred and twenty fifth of a second at a focal length of what were we at? Da dum pum 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 five hundred and sixty mil. So this is the Canon two hundred four hundred with the teleconverter, the internal teleconverter engaged, and uh, yeah, hundred and twenty fifth of a second, ISO four thousand. So yeah, let's get back to uh, the develop module, and all I'm going to do is that little dodge that I showed you before, but probably didn't explain what I was doing very much. If you notice how granular this uh, noise looks, um, this is a problem with a little bit of pre-sharpening that I've always suspected is present in the uh, demosaicing algorithm that Lightroom uses. And we're going to come into the details panel in a minute and just ease this sharpening back but I just want to go back to the basics panel and I just want you to concentrate on this area here because if I just ease back on the clarity and add a little bit of dehaze overall the image isn't suffering from it but these feathers are just ever so slightly less jarring they look a little bit less fuzzy because that fuzziness when you go to put sharpening on will actually look bad it will and uh, i'm just speaking from the point of view somebody who's for a long time been used to producing files for very very large prints not just for myself but for a lot of other people as well and these are the things that save money when you do large prints large prints cost a lot of money and if you've made a screw up in the processing people aren't very happy no so i'm quite happy with that i will come to the details panel i'm just going to back the sharpening off just a little bit i'm going to drop the radius and uh, we'll just pull the detail slider back just a little bit as well and you can see the Overall, the noise has calmed down just a little bit, and we haven't put any noise reduction on. And of course, with this being on a, a 1DX Mark One, um, ISO 4000, this is probably equivalent to somewhere between eight and ten thousand on a 1DX Mark Two, and what it's equivalent to on a 1DX Mark Three, it's probably equivalent to about fourteen to sixteen thousand. So, you know, this is a very valid workflow. Now, for an A4 print, this noise wouldn't show up on an A4 print. On an A3, it might do. But, obviously, the image is a long way from finished. Um, the other thing I'm going to do is just warm the image up ever so slightly. Rather like that. And I'll come into the HSL panel and... I'll actually increase the saturation of oranges a bit, increase the saturation of yellows, and then I might just go and increase the luminance of orange and the luminance of yellow. Just a smidgen. But the big kicker is that um, slight adjustment on the colour temperature, just to take that majorly blue tinge off the goss and make him look a little bit more realistic right so we are just going to go to edit 
open this smart object in Photoshop and we'll just go through exactly the same process again and all I want to do is to try and reinforce this workflow in you so you know you can adopt it where you need it because I mean if you read any of the Topaz Labs instructions they always tell you that you should do this noise reduction right at the very start of the image process now some people think right i'll do it in lightroom i'll send it as a tiff into photoshop and then the first thing i will do is the noise reduction in topaz incorrect no 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 that means that the uh, noise in the image is actually going to be affected by all the pre-adjustments that you do inside of the lights or Lightroom or Camera Raw or whatever and then you are baking them into the image before you start applying noise reduction that is not a good idea because in your finer details you might actually have increased the level of noise unwittingly because you haven't been careful enough and checked it at a high enough magnification so Doing this gets you around all those future bear traps and pitfalls that you might have working for you when you process your higher ISO images. So, there we go. Always a ramble, filter, Topaz Labs, Denoise. Invoking it as a plugin, yes, thank you very much. But this is a plugin, don't forget in a layered workflow that is actually operating on a raw file yeah and look at that i mean that is just stupid clean we don't really need to do a lot do we actually need 15 points of noise reduction on you can click ok if you like and apply it but noise reduction kills fine detail so even though we're only at 15, the default 15, it might be too much. So in other words, we might actually be able to get hold of a little bit more detail. And just wait for it to uh, load the preview up. And I'm just going to turn this down to, let's turn it down to 5. And um, now we're just getting some detail differences in here. Just a little bit more. Take it down to, I'll take it down to four. And I'm quite pleased with that. I'm not going to put any more sharpening on. You could take a little bit off and then sharpen it in a separate layer in Lightroom uh, with a mask. Yeah, I mean, I've shown you how to do that in previous videos. So I'm not going to bother doing it here. Otherwise, this video is going to go on for ages. And uh, so all I'm going to do is just click apply. And there we go. And I think he just looks absolutely super smashing great. Yeah. Let's just do something a little bit oddball now. I'm going to duplicate this smart object. Uh, where are we? Have I come to the wrong one? Yes, possibly. Um, new smart object via copy. Now, of course, what that new smart object via copy has done is it's brought in a duplicate of the filter layer as well for Topaz. I actually want to right click on there and go clear smart filters. And now it's just brought me noise back. And all I want to do is to drop this to around about, around about there, so around about 35%. I'm still keeping a lovely degree of smoothness in this what was hideous background, but I'm just letting 35% of the original unnoise reduced detail just sort of gloss over the actual goshawk itself. Yeah, I could go and put a vignette on that image now. I could do a little bit more localized sharpening. Um, inside of Photoshop and we would have an eminently usable image and an eminently printable one and an eminently saleable one 
Um, I don't know. Not really, not with all these feathers here, but well, there you go. Anyway, guys and gals, hope you found that useful. Hope you found it interesting. There is a link below um, to where you can go and pick up Topaz Denoise because you can never have enough tools in your toolbox and it is exceptionally useful. Sometimes it's very good for producing uh, noise reduction on a raw file brought straight into it. It does do a very good job. Sometimes, other times, not quite so good. But the way to get around that is to bring the raw file from Lightroom or Camera Raw into Photoshop as a Camera Raw smart object and then deploy Topaz Denoise uh, from there. Yes. So as I said, there is a link below. And in all honesty, it is an affiliate link. You know, I don't have many. In point of fact, I only... I only really have two, don't I? That's this one. I do get a little bit if you buy it. And uh, Greg Benzie's Lumenzia. Yes. So, uh, I don't have loads and loads of affiliate links on the bottom of my videos. So, yeah, there you go. Anyway, as I said, hope you found it useful. Hope you found it interesting. And uh, if you like it, give it a thumbs up. Leave a comment in the comment section below. Uh, if you're not already subscribed, go click the subscribe button. Click the ringety tingety bell. To get a notification of next time I put a video up. And until then, see ya. Toodaloo.